Um, good afternoon, everyone. It is really good to have an opportunity to talk in a session that's focused on our fishing industry and building trust in that industry. It's quite unusual as a biologist to be able to talk in a session focused on that. As you're all aware, public perceptions do matter and they have real consequences, particularly for the fishing industry where they're operating in you know, our oceans and on natural resources. And the industry can see those consequences when you look at changes in how they have to operate and changes in access to the resources. You can also see the impact in terms of what people buy and the seafood they're interested in consuming. These are all the impacts at the domestic level, but there's also obviously um, the perceptions in our markets are important as well. But they're in a different form because the fishing isn't happening in their backyard. So today I'm going to focus on you know, one of the roles of government in terms of fostering <coughs> trust, and that is around information provision. You know, reliable, um, trustworthy information can help foster trust in industries. So I'm going to talk about that in the context of the outlook for seafood and also the national status reports. As a brief overview in terms of the seafood outlook, if you were sat through this morning's talks, you would have seen that you know there's only um, the projections for growth in terms of demand are seen across a range of commodities, and seafood's no different to that. You know, both Australian and global consumption continues to increase. If we look at um, the supply patterns over the last decade, our imports of edible seafood have increased substantially, but the Australian production in terms of volume has been relatively constant. In comparison, the value of Australian fisheries production has reduced substantially over the last decade. Aquaculture is now making a much greater contribution to our production than previously. And I think everyone would be aware that there are increasing expectations, particularly around sustainability and other issues from our fisheries. And these expectations have an impact on supply and demand. So if we look in a bit more detail, um, as I said, the demand for seafood has been increasing. Since the 1980s, um, people have increased worldwide the amount of seafood they're eating by about 50%. Okay. Seafood now accounts for 16% of the animal protein consumed worldwide. And it's particularly important in developing countries and in some of our near neighbours. In Australia, we've seen a similar trend. So over the past three decades, seafood consumption in Australia has increased we're currently, um, Australians eat more seafood per year than the world average. You know, we're about 25 kilograms per person. And some of our key export markets have a similar um, above average consumption of seafood. So Japan, which used to be our major market, they eat nearly 60 kilograms of seafood a year per person. China, um, which is you know, now the main um, destination for our seafood products also has an above average seafood consumption. In all regions of the world except for Africa, the per capita seafood consumption is projected to increase. So this demand is only going to grow. From an Australian perspective, um, supply of seafood, the um, seafood imports are an important part of supply. So I'm sure you're all aware that seafood's a highly traded commodity, about 38% of global production is traded. FAO has estimated that um, exports of seafood worldwide, you know, have reached a global high again um, in 2011 at an estimated $126 billion in US. You know, that's a 16% increase on 2010. From an Australian perspective, you can see that while there's been increased demand, the value of our exports has declined substantially over the last decade. So it's decreased by about 57%. That's a decrease of $1.6 billion. Now, 
The strength of the Australian dollar has been one of the key drivers in that. As our dollar appreciates, you know, our um, exports are less competitive and on the domestic market, you know, our domestic product has to compete with cheaper imports that may also reduce beach prices. A lot of the decline in exports has come from some key commodities, particularly in the wild catch area, and that has been changes in prices of um, some of our major exports, particularly shellfish and crustaceans. Those two groups alone have decreased by $1.3 billion over that time period. The, the other um, important factor in terms of fisheries trade is obviously the imports. So while you can see imports of fisheries products into Australia has been relatively constant over that decade, but the actual edible component of seafood of that has increased by 10% over that time period. We're continuing to see um, increased imports in processed and prepackaged foods. You know, canned tuna is one of the key products that's imported into Australia. If we look at the broader production, um, you can see again that worldwide production has increased substantially. You know, in the 1970s, we were about 50 million tonnes. We're now reaching, you know, well over 150 million tonnes seafood worldwide. Production of um, fish and seafood continues to be higher than beef, chicken or pork worldwide. And it's projected to stay higher than those products. I'm sure most of you are aware as well that since 19, about the 1990s, most of that growth in production has come from aquaculture. You can see wild capture fisheries have been relatively stable since that time. And really there isn't much projections for growth in wild capture fisheries. What I was also highlighting on this graph is where Australia sits on that world stage. You know, we are a relatively small producer in terms of volume. You know, if you actually had to graph our production on there, it would barely show. If we look at the Australian production in terms of value, over the last decade, again, there's been a decline in the value of our total fisheries production by about 47%. So it's nearly halved in value. The decline has slowed. So you can see a lot of that decline um, took place in the first half of the, of the decade. And you know between 2009-10 and 2010-11, it's been relatively stable. You can also see that aquaculture has moderated that decline to some extent. And you can see that the relative contribution of aquaculture is much larger. Now it's now making up about 43% of Australian production. The wild capture fisheries um, reduction in value has particularly been driven by changes in um, four major commodities, the tuna, prawns, rock lobster and abalone. The combined value of those four groups um, reduced by 50% over the last decade. You know, they used to make up over 60% of production, now they make up um, around 46%. So in summary, um, if you look at the projected outlook for Australian fisheries, um, there aren't projections of vast changes, even though the global projections in terms of demand for seafood and seafood consumption are increasing. Given the influence of the Australian dollar's um, strength on the value of our production, you know, we're not seeing predictions of large changes. One of the most difficult things to predict is how changes in community expectations or sustainability expectations affect the demand and supply. Now, I'm sure most of you are aware that some of the peaks in Australian fisheries production in the late 80s and 90s were based on unsustainable harvest rates. You know, we were taking too many fish in some fisheries and the biomass was being reduced. And so there's been management in place to address some of those issues and you see that reflected in production. Another example um, comes from the Commonwealth fisheries where you know, moving towards 2005, we were seeing an increased number of stocks regarded as overfished and subject to overfishing. 
the government provided the direction to seize over fishing, implementation of a harvest strategy um, policy. And you know, as a result of those measures, we saw reductions in total allowable catch, which mean a reduction in the volume of, your, um, of what's produced from fisheries. And from a management perspective, that's probably a good outcome. Although I think it is a good outcome if you're overfishing the stock, you need to reduce harvest rates. But from you know, just looking at the volume of production, those signals can be seen as um, you know, reducing supply. I think one of the issues the industry has to deal with in particular is the fact that a lot of public perception comes from information from around the world, not necessarily just Australia. Uh, yesterday, the Sydney Morning Herald um, printed that quote as part of an article um, by Julian Cribb on food scarcity. You know, so very clear statement that fish are getting scarcer and harder to catch. You know, and I, I'm sure a lot of you and I know, w I would argue that that doesn't actually apply to a, a majority of Australian fisheries, given the management situation. But this is what we see in our newspapers. A lot of, some of the other sustainability expectations are around environment and bycatch issues, and I think you'll hear more around those from WWF and also from Anthony and the shark fishery this afternoon. So moving um, in terms of the outlook to talking about um, you know, one of government's roles in terms of providing information to help foster trust. As most of you are aware, all the jurisdictions do some form of status reporting. But for a person who's interested in a particular species you know, or a particular part of the ocean, it can actually be very difficult to find out what's going on if you have to search through these. And so making that information accessible to the public is part of um, working towards an understanding of our industry. So in December uh, last year, in partnership with FRDC and fisheries research agencies from all the jurisdictions and the CSIRO, the first Status of Key Australian Fish Stocks report was released. If you were here last year, we were talking about how this was going to come. Well, now it's here. It was released initially online. Hopefully, a lot of you have had a chance to look at that. And the hard copies are now available. It covers 49 key commercial species. You know, in Australian fisheries, we have well over 600 commercial species. Clearly, you can't deal with all of them in the first edition. So. We took the 49 key species in terms of the amount they contributed to value and also volume of production. We also aim to cover as many um, species that went across jurisdictions and also the diversity of Australian seafood. So everything from prawns and lobsters to scallops, sharks and tuna. If recreational or indigenous catch was important for that species and there was information we tried to include it there as well. And one of the key parts in releasing these reports is the fact that there was a common biological reference point used for all the stocks. So the status of stocks was assessed against a common biological framework, whether or not um, the stocks were reduced to a point where you might be expecting recruitment over fishing. So the harvest rates have been too high and the number of fish left is starting to get to the point where you have a higher risk of recruitment failure. Another key outcome in the report was focusing on biological stocks. So here we see snapper. A lot of people know and love that fish for a range of reasons. Um, if you were looking at snapper on the east coast of Australia, from Queensland you know, down towards Victoria, that's thought to be a single biological stock. So the report was trying to bring together the assessments to make a single status so that people knew what was happening in that stock. In comparison, you know, if you're fishing for snapper in WA, what's happening on the east coast of Australia isn't going to make much difference at all in terms of those stocks. But it was important, you know, from a biological perspective to try and bring these integrated assessments together. So what did we find? Across the 49 species, we did 150 um, stock status classifications. Most of those are for biological stocks, but if that wasn't possible, we used the management unit or the jurisdiction. Most of those stocks, um, the target species, the stock, was classified as a sustainable stock. So the level of harvest and the amount of fish 
were at a were both at a point where you could say that stock was sustainable. We had 11 stocks classified as transitional, where the um, biomass was either increasing or decreasing, and we had two classified as overfished. The assessments were based on um, 2010 data, and the overfished stocks classified then were school shark and southern bluefin tuna, both of which have management um, and rebuilding plans in place but as part of the criteria, there has yet to be evidence of recovery in those stocks. You can see that out of the catch that the status of key Australian fish stocks reports covers, over 90% of that catch was classified as coming from um, sustainable stocks. There were 39 stocks that we were unable to classify, so they were classified as undefined. This meant there was easing either insufficient evidence or um, the assessments of status were too uncertain. The undefined stocks contributed a less than 5% of the catch that we were looking at. So they tend to come from smaller fisheries where there's less information, though that's not always the case. We have some snapper stocks which are classified as uncertain here. One of the important aspects of the report was providing accessibility and transparency. And so while the status assessment focuses on the target species alone, if you go into the website or you go into the reports, they provide detail on where those, the scientific basis of those assessments, and there's also some commentary on the environmental effects of fishing and the effects of the environment on the fisheries themselves. So in summary, um, you know, the outlook for Australian seafood and fisheries production, relatively stable, no huge changes, but, you know, I think there's a fair bit of uncertainty around that, um, particularly given, you know, how we respond to community expectations and how those may develop over time. One element, particularly from a government perspective, is providing that reliable um, information source so that people can start to engage and start to understand the status of our fisheries. Thank you.